hey, so is there anything you can remember watching as a kid that left literally no impact on you one way or another? Like, not in the sense that it was forgettable per se, you could definitely tell someone the plot and details of it if you were asked, it's just, you know, there was nothing about it that made it worth revisiting after a single watch. It wasn't gripping enough to hold your attention, it wasn't weighty enough for you to care, it didn't say or do anything you hadn't seen done better before, it just sort of existed. And so, after you watched it once, with no real incentive to look at or think about it ever again, you just left it behind and moved on with your life, knowing there were better things you could be spending your time on. Is that something you ever experienced? Because, personally speaking, I can only think of it happening maybe a couple times during my childhood. It was a very rare thing for me to just watch something once and then never again explicitly because I was bored. And I feel like that's something a lot of people can relate to, seeing as how when you're a kid, almost everything you experience is fascinating and new. It's why we were able to watch so much genuine slop growing up and get invested like it was the peak of fiction. Kids haven't seen enough media to recognize when something's cliched. They have no reference point for quality or creativity, and so to them, pretty much anything they come across feels like a new discovery worth their time. It's a very understandable thing. After all, someone who's never seen literally anything ever before, Johnny Test looks freaking sweet. That's just the way it goes when you've got shit to compare it to. You end up finding value in practically everything since your media consumption is close to zero. Nothing you watch feels stale, or at least it shouldn't. And that's why I'm so interested in cases where, despite it all, some things you watch still find a way to be uninteresting. Since for you to find something that's so endlessly dull, even fetus you wouldn't watch it again, it's gotta be one of the most shallow pieces of mediocrity ever conceived. And in my case, that thing was a 2015 animated movie called Home, which, ugh, god, even saying the title for it makes me want to yawn. Home. Psh, what, was friend taken? How about family? Or love? Or no, 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 I got it. Brave. I mean, hey, since we're clearly having a contest for who can come up with the most generic name in human history. Like, seriously, who would ever want to go to a movie titled Home? It's too ambiguous. There's nothing distinct about the plot or themes you can understand from that title alone. It's basically telling you from the start it's got no identity. And when you look at the contents of the film itself, that's exactly what you get. Something with nothing to offer, narratively or otherwise, that you couldn't easily find in most other films from around the time. Legit, every element of this film's design you've seen a billion times somewhere else. The plot is a world-spanning buddy comedy road trip about two guys who hate each other slowly becoming friends. The protagonists are a quirky awkward alien and a sassy teenage girl with an adorable pet cat. The alien's an outcast who's hated by his race for having the audacity to make mistakes. The girl is looking for her mom we know nothing about beyond a basic home video she's always watching to remind you that's her motivation. The alien's race are a bunch of cutesy, funny-talking merch dispensers who use everyday things in hilariously wrong ways since they don't know what they're for. The message is that you should be true to yourself in the face of adversity. The villain is a smooth-talking dumbass who's lame and pathetic. The story is full of these badly utilized tropes and contrivances like a countdown to destruction, a montage of the leads getting closer and taking pictures, an artificial third-act breakup, a Chicken Little-style twist villain, a fucking dance party ending set to a happy pop song while the alien narrates how great everything is. And that's only the short list. Believe me, pretty much every single kid's movie cliche you can think of is in this movie. It's almost kind of impressive. Like, they hit literally every fucking beat you can think of, dude. There's genuinely nothing in Home that wasn't done better by something else 50 years ago. Hell, it's such a generic, charmless, by-the-numbers piece of slop that under most circumstances, I wouldn't even bother talking about it, since, you know, at the end of the day, what's the point? It's a dull movie with dull writing and dull characters you could essentially find in any other dull film from around the dull time. There's nothing about it that stands out. So, what makes me want to bring it up now over something else with potentially more substance? Well, if you read the title, you should already know, so I'm not sure why I even bothered to ask, but the truth is, while yes, this film is totally mid and has nothing worth talking about by itself, it becomes a totally different story when you take into account the book it's loosely based on. Yeah, that's right, this terribly bland, flavorless movie actually has a source material that inspired it. And more surprisingly than that, it's not nearly as disposable or fucking 
soulless. In fact, as far as children's literature goes, I gotta say, this book, The True Meaning of Smek Day, on top of just having an exponentially better title, holy shit, is probably one of the most insightful, funny, heartfelt, self-aware, and overall high-effort novels I've read in a good while. Like, it's legitimately insane to me just how big the gap between these two really is. There's practically zero overlap in terms of quality, and the craziest part about it is that I'm pretty sure it was an intentional choice by DreamWorks to make the film less challenging. I mean, they remove most of the book's themes, violence, humor, tension, overarching social commentary. Basically everything about Smek Day that initially gave it depth and maturity are completely gone, and the few things they decide to keep are missing so much context to make them work, they might as well have been left behind. Shit, there's such a massive discrepancy between the two, you can even see it visually in the designs of the main aliens, the Boov, who've gone from being weird and off-putting, but also recognizable and charmingly unique, to just boringly safe, marketable plushies. Like, this contrast tells you everything you need to know about what home's priorities were in the long run. And it's exactly why I find the film's mediocrity so endlessly fascinating. Because it didn't just come from a lack of ideas or poor execution, nah, this movie's blandness came from taking something with soul and cutting its balls off to be more generally appealing. And in my opinion, that's about the worst possible thing an adaptation can do. There's nothing that gets me angrier than replacing something meaningful with edgeless slop to be less provocative. And when I look at this movie compared to Smek Day, that's all I see. Edgeless slop. And it's a real shame, since as I was reading Smek Day, one of the first things I noticed was how its willingness to go places most kids' media wouldn't was what helped its messages resonate particularly strong. It's a story defined by its big ideas and attention to detail, so seeing all that thought removed for the sake of not offending... I don't know, anyone is so goddamn infuriating to me. Especially considering some of the things home chooses to replace those ideas with. For instance, let's talk about what the Boov are meant to represent in each respective story. Seeing as between Home and Smek Day, while their roles in the plot are actually pretty similar as a whole, the two works have very different interpretations for what groups the Boov are meant to symbolize. And strangely enough, in the case of the film, by them sanding it down to be less targeted than the book, it not only leads to the thing having less of a point that's not nearly as clear, but hardly makes any sense? You see, at the core of each story, the Boov's involvement can be summed up like this. They invade the Earth and take it over, they move humans to small bits of land so they can have the rest, they abduct the mom of the main girl, 11-year-old Gratuity Tucci, aka Tip, leading to her deciding to take the family car in hopes she'll find her at the nearest human area, they make her crash near instantly by attacking her, helping her find a fugitive Boov named JLo, or O oh, in the movie, at a gas station, who fixes her car in exchange for a ride, and for the rest of the story, they serve as an ever looming antagonist restructuring the Earth to meet their needs as Tip and JLo try to avoid them. Now, based on that description, what do you think the Boov are meant to represent allegorically? Because in the context of the book, it makes a lot of sense. They're colonizers. They are English colonizers and the human race are Native Americans. Like, it seems obvious when I say it, right? They come to Earth and say they're taking over, they overpower us with tech beyond our comprehension, they walk into people's homes and claim them as their own, they relocate us to small areas so they don't have to deal with us, they rename Earth to Smekland after their leader since they found it, they call humans noble savages and say we're like animals. It's about as blatant a metaphor for colonization as you could get, and so with that in mind, you'd almost think Dream DreamWorks would have to keep it, given the story literally can't happen without the Boov doing all that colonizing behavior. However, you've also got to think about how colonization makes you sad. I mean, the book's got all these pages about seniors crying as they're forced to leave their homes, descriptions about the process of humanity losing hope, Tip running into victims who've been affected and are trying to cope in the wake of this ruining their lives. It's almost like colonization is a bad thing, but DreamWorks can't have their marketable plushes be oppressive space tyrants, that's not gonna sell to kids 4 to 11. These guys are supposed to be DreamWorks' minions, and the minions never did anything bad. Don't ask who they serve from 1933 to 1945. So what can the home team possibly do to turn this around? How can they make oppressive colonizers less bad without fundamentally changing what they do? Well, in most circumstances, people would step back after asking that question and realize, hold on, that's insane, why would anyone want to do that, I sound like Christopher Columbus right now, but the home team were not most people. No, 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 no. 
They were on a mission. A mission to chase that non-denominational inoffensive bag, no matter how much they had to contort this story in order to do it. And so they came up with the ingenious solution of turning the booth into immigrants. Wait, what? Yeah, immigrants. That was the best idea the crew could think of without completely changing their role in the story. They turned the move from invading space pilgrims into invading space refugees. And my fucking god, it is the most hilarious shit I've ever seen. Like, I can just imagine the writer's room thinking this up going, Okay guys, so the move are looking for a new home planet, right? You know who else does that? Immigrants. We should turn them into immigrants. No, 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 guys, guys, it'll be great, really. All we gotta do is change the motivation here, remove a bunch of atrocities there, get rid of all the people affected so we never have to think about what the Booth did, make it so they conquered Earth to hide from their enemies instead of manifest destiny, don't ever mention the thousands of people they killed, definitely don't mention when it's implied they ate people, fuck it, make Tip an immigrant too so her and O can be parallels, skim over the invasion in a funny montage so it's less horrible. Horrific, have it end with them staying on Earth and becoming friends with humans, and done. <laughs> now that's one fine looking allegory. Why doesn't ours look like that? And I'll tell you why. Because newsflash, this doesn't work as an immigrant story. It's just not what the boob are. Like, you can put in all the little citations you fucking want to make them seem less malicious. It doesn't change the fact that they still invaded the Earth, took everyone's homes, put them somewhere else, and stole the planet. There's no getting around that. Do you seriously want to frame these guys as an allegory for immigrants? The ones who literally invade people's homes and forcibly steal their land? Shit, the only way this could work as a metaphor for immigrants is if it's following the Great Replacement Theory. You know, that far-right talking point saying immigrants are replacing ethnically white people that originally came from this author in... France? The place the Booves set up their headquarters in the movie? Ah, come on guys, really? Like, okay, look, I know it's a coincidence. I don't genuinely think DreamWorks is slipping xenophobic conspiracy theories into a kid's film, but I feel like the fact I can connect those dots at all should be more than enough to hint that there's something wrong here. And there is, since these guys are very clearly the fucking villains. They're the bad guys. Duh. Sorry, I couldn't resist. But seriously, why would you turn the villains into your immigrant allegory? That's just asking for people to misinterpret you. And on top of that, why aren't they treated like villains when that's obviously what they are? I mean, even by this film's standards, the Boov do more than enough for the people of Earth to justifiably hate them, yet after the Boov's enemies show up to cause havoc and leave shortly after when O realizes it's a sitcom misunderstanding, everyone on Earth just seems to accept the boob as if they did nothing wrong. There's hardly any acknowledgement of what they did at the start. No one brings up the forced removals, relocations, general destruction, none of it. The film sweeps that all under the rug so we can have this forced happy ending where everyone gets along and dances to a Rihanna song. It's bullshit. I mean, again, you can infantilize the boob and their actions all you want. It doesn't change the fact that this is literally an epilogue where the colonizers befriend the people they oppressed by taking care of a bigger threat they brought along with them. Does that not seem just a little bit fucked to anyone? Like, this is some Pocahontas-level revisionism, but at least Pocahontas kept out the part where the pilgrims robbed the natives' crops. Ah, but hey, I forgot the Booth do funny little dances, and the main one's voiced by Sheldon Cooper, playing Sheldon Cooper but an alien. So all is forgiven. And you know, speaking of which, I do really want to hone in on O specifically here, as he's actually another great example of the film replacing something meaningful with edgeless slop. You see, in Smec Day, the main character was Tip. It was unambiguously her story. In fact, the whole book is framed as a series of essays on what she considers the true meaning of Smec Day a year after the Booth left, so everything is very distinctly from her perspective, and aside from it leading to loads of these funny observations that only a tween can make about the world, it also helps in conveying her very personal story about a girl who's been forced to act like an adult since way before her mom was captured. See, unlike the movie, where the mom is practically a cardboard cutout due to a pronounced lack of screen time, 
point, in the book we actually learn a lot about who she is as a person, and in short, the best way to describe her is that she's earnestly well-meaning, but unrepentantly fucking stupid. She's immature, childish, oblivious, gullible, basically the perfect storm of I wouldn't last five days on my own if someone wasn't helping. And in her situation as a broke single mom, the only someone who could help was always Tip, who was essentially forced to clean up after her mom's mistakes to make sure they stayed healthy and had savings. She'd throw out expired food when the mom got it for free from her job, she'd get their money back when she bought overpriced garbage off of scammers, she'd try to set up doctor's appointments when she was too stubborn to go. Pretty much any chance Tip could find to be the adult her mom wasn't, she did. And it led to her developing this level of self-made independence that's partially the reason she stayed alive for the six months she was alone before her road trip. Because from experience, she already knew how to survive, and what she didn't know she could learn. Whether it was cooking, navigating, managing resources, fuck, she even taught herself how to drive by putting paint cans on her feet and practicing at night. That's how self-reliant she is. Tip was practically conditioned from birth to make it in this scenario. But that doesn't mean that she should have been. And it also doesn't mean that she is an adult. She might be able to play the part of one when she's got no other option if she wants to live, but in the end, despite never getting the chance to act like one for most of her life, she is just a kid. A kid who's smart and mature for her age, no doubt about that, but a kid nonetheless who needs to realize that being a kid sometimes is okay. She doesn't have to face everything by herself. She doesn't have to bottle up her emotions. It's a reality she's never had the chance to think about, given she's never really had the choice before, but a kid shouldn't have to bear the weight of the world on their shoulders, and as she tries to, she keeps finding herself getting in trouble. So thus, her arc over the story is mainly about letting herself be vulnerable, whether it's freaking out, crying, or letting someone else take care of her when she especially needs it, and allowing herself to get close to JLo on their trip since, excluding her cat pig, she's been isolated this whole time and needs someone she can rely on, even if as she's describing it in writing, you can tell she doesn't want to admit it. And that's part of where the importance of her being the main lead comes from. It lets us see inside her head and understand just how obsessed with control she really is, particularly during moments where she doesn't have it. Like, I'm not gonna mention anything too specific here, since I want you to read the book and come to those moments on your own, but whenever a situation's too much for Tip to handle, you can just feel the mask slip in her desperation trying to keep it together. I mean, the way she describes her confidence shattering as she's forced to confront her own helplessness, it can be almost hard to read sometimes just for how viscerally real it is, and that's exactly what makes Tip so amazing as a lead. Everything about her feels real. Her backstory is depressingly common in real life. Her hangups and flaws are relatable as hell. Her freakouts over losing control are gut-wrenching in their emotional weight. And when you put all that together in her singular arc of overcoming it across the story, fucking chills, dude. Really, I can't think of almost any character that conveys the kid needs to learn that being a kid is okay message better than Tip and her struggle authentically do, and all through such a powerful, grounded way you wouldn't expect from an alien adventure book, too. It's... Whew, man, it's something else. Hmm? Oh, what did that have to do with O's character in the movie? Sorry, I thought it would go without saying, but, uh, yeah, seeing as Tip's story is nuanced and mature and about what parental neglect does to kids, you can probably already guess the home team decided to look at that story and promptly threw it the fuck away. That's right, baby, it's all gone. Tip's development? Erased. Her backstory? Erased. Her struggle? Erased. Everything that made Tip who she was in the book was completely removed for the film, and in its place, she was given literally nothing. No arcs, no traits, no struggles, nada. All she is now is a generically sassy average tween with a cute animal sidekick who's looking for her mom. Hell, she isn't even the main character anymore. That distinction has gone to O, who, in keeping thematically with his colonizer roots, has essentially stolen all of Tip's relevance for the sake of a new character arc that it more or less boils down to Actually guys, the boob are really sympathetic and you definitely shouldn't think of them as colonizers because that's all it's trying to do. It wants to convince us the boob aren't so bad by focusing on one who's, get this, a social outcast. And not just that, he's an outcast for being different and quirky and wanting to make friends instead of conforming like everyone else. Wow. He's... 
He's just like me for real. He could never do anything wrong. He's just a funny little guy. And look, he's got to learn about feeling more than one emotion at once and not running away when there's a low chance of success. Whoa, if that's what all the Boover like, then they can't be bad. They're too precious. I just, here, take my money, take it all. I love you, Sheldon Cooper. Bazinga! Bazinga! Okay, but genuinely, I don't think I've ever felt more pandered to in my entire fucking life. Like, they seriously took an earnest, touching, relatable story about a girl fighting her deep-seated personal issues after years of it shaping who she is, and made it about an awkward nerd who learns it's okay to be different. Do I even need to say what's wrong with this picture? Do I really need to? Because, honestly, I feel like that comparison speaks for itself. It's just... Wow, fuck you. Fuck you, and your focus-tested emotional journey, and your sidelining of the original main character, and your incessant downplaying of colonialism, and all your other whack-ass attempts to get me to like O without actually earning it. I mean, you can just smell the desperation in these decisions. The casting of Jim Parsons as his voice since Big Bang Theory was number two on syndication that year. The shoving in loads of slapstick to give him a cartoony, innocent, dumb dum vibe that could do no wrong. The totally not a fake-out death at the end to trick you into thinking you formed a connection with him. It's all fucking calculated. The writers are throwing out every possible trick they can think of to make O seem lovable simply by proxy. And the obvious reason for why is because when you strip back the layers to look at O objectively, he falls flat. His arc is predictable, his growth is limited, his friendship with Tip is a total joke since they've both been reduced to basic stereotypes. And the worst part of it all? Not a single aspect of his character feels sincere. There's nothing about him that feels real or genuine or relatable or honest or, at the end of the day, fucking human. And look, I know it sounds a little funny for me to say an alien creature lacks humanity, but it's actually even funnier knowing that was the whole point of the boob in Smek Day. That even though they seem, well, alien when you look at their actions completely out of context, the truth is that they're no different from humans, both for better and for worse. And you want to guess which character was originally used to show that? Yeah. It was J-Lo, whose arc in the book was all about showing the Boov can have humanity. See, in the beginning, being that Smack Day is, of course, written from Tip's perspective, the first time we're introduced to the Boov isn't through one of them narrating about, oh, this is the best day ever, and aren't we so relatable, and aren't we so nice and not evil at all, can't you see? We have good intentions. No, it's through the way she initially sees them when they invade Earth. As grotesque, scary, unfeeling bastards who stole her mom and try to kill her on sight. Or in other words, monsters. It's an impression that's supposed to make us assume the Boov are just like the evil creatures you see in most typical alien invasion stories. However, that image starts to fade really quickly as soon as she runs into J-Lo, who, unlike the other Boov tips come across so far in the story, not only speaks to her at all, but is actually pretty friendly out the gate and even says he thinks the Boov and humans can get along. A statement that seems pretty absurd given what we've seen them do so far, but as we learn a bit more about JLo's perspective through him tagging along, it starts to make a whole lot of sense why him and the Boov would really think like that. He mentions how they assumed the invasion was helping Earth, that they believed they had every right to take it, that humans were undeveloped and needed the Boov so they could prosper. Essentially, he was saying the Boov thought of themselves as heroes for what they'd done. And when we hear about Boov society as a whole, it slowly becomes clear that the root of that belief isn't just ego or rotten ideals, but rather it's the result of their conniving leaders who've been feeding the Boov false information about Earth to make stealing it seem noble through straight up lies. That's why they've been able to do so much horrific shit without an ounce of remorse. They've been indoctrinated into thinking it's for the greater good. Now, does that justify the literal thousands of people they've killed? Obviously not. And unlike home, this revelation isn't trying to excuse them. Smek Day is very explicit that what these guys did shouldn't be forgotten. No, all this information is meant to tell us is that the Boov aren't monsters, they're people. And that means they don't just have the ability to make huge, awful, catastrophic mistakes, but potentially, if given the chance, 
they can change. Which is exactly what happens to JLo as he comes to realize what the Boov have done. He sees the destruction they've caused, the survivors they've affected, the lives they've ruined, and as he makes his way across the country with Tip, hearing all the ways she's been affected while bonding over their many shared near-death experiences along the way, he eventually understands that what the Boov did was wrong. They were never the good guys in this scenario, humans didn't need them. In fact, all they ever did was bring harm through their arrival. And it's through JLo being able to not just recognize this, but apologize to Tip and make an effort to undo what they've done, that we can comfortably know JLo was never a bad person. He was just a good guy who happened to be born on the wrong side. He didn't choose to have leaders who would lie to him about what the truth is, but he did choose to fix his mistakes when he figured out he'd done wrong. And that tells you all you need to know about who he is. And I don't think they could have told it any better than the way it was. It's just a perfect character arc that says a lot about human nature and gives you more of a reason to like JLo than a bunch of cheap tricks ever could. There's actual effort put into getting you invested in his story, but... Eh, you know, for it to work, the Boof would have to be just like people, which, like I said, in Home, they definitely aren't. I mean, there's literally a scene where Tip explains to him what empathy is, since he's never felt it. But more importantly than that, for it to work, Home would also have to be okay with presenting uh, harsh topics and complex ideas. And they can't have that. The viewing public doesn't want complexity, they don't want to think. They want cuteness, they want routine. They want a story about Sheldon Cooper and Rihanna bonding over music that sounds suspiciously like her. And so that's what they got. And people watched it. Those box office returns don't lie. By all fiscal metrics, Home as a Product was a big hit, but as a worthwhile movie, it was a total failure. And that's reflected in how nobody gives a shit nine years later. It's just not the kind of film that's made to leave an impact, and that sucks, since Smack Day, to me, is pretty much the opposite of that in every single way. It's the kind of book you just can't help but think about for how well it delivers its messages, gets you invested in its characters, has a wickedly creative lore, dark humor, beautiful artwork, and I'm only just scratching the surface. There are so many smaller things I didn't get to bring up that I wanted to. The gore, the technology, the wider cast, the callbacks, the ending. Really, there's not a thing this book does that I wouldn't consider almost perfect, but I'd prefer to get this video out at a reasonable time, so to sum up the main thing it does that sets it apart from a piece of mid like home, well, I don't think there's a more fitting way for me to show it than by going back to what I said sums up the film's priorities at the start of this video, the design of the boove. On one side, you've got Mr. Generic Marketable Plush Guy. He's squishy, he's cute. He's practically begging you to pick him up off the shelf at Target and bug your parents to buy him. Everything about him is perfectly in line. While on the other side, you've got- Ugh! What the fuck is that? Ugh. It's all fleshy and skin colored. He's got little elephant legs and fish eyes and a wide mouth that stretches across his face. This guy isn't cute at all. But that's not really what it's going for now, is it? No. This thing isn't concerned with being cute. It wants you to find him a little off-putting. You're supposed to see this guy and go, whoa, what the hell is that thing? So you'll be drawn to figure out what his deal is. And he does draw you in in a way the first design just doesn't. Because it's weird, it's different. It's not afraid to make you feel a bit uncomfortable to catch your attention and Hey, now that you're really looking at it, it's kind of charming. Like, not in a cute charming way, it doesn't make you want to go, ah, and throw your money at it like the focus-tested version, but from another angle, those fish eyes are sort of funny. That mouth is almost dopey, that skin is... Okay, the skin is still creepy, but there is a genuine appeal to this design that sticks with you after the shock. There's layers to what this guy makes you feel as you look at him that the first guy just doesn't do to him being so basic. When you see the first guy, you know exactly what he's about, and it's boring. He's cute, he's marketable, he's safe. End of story. There's nothing else to take away. But this guy? This guy's got nuance. He's not so easy to figure out. He makes you want to keep looking, even if the emotions you're feeling aren't all directly positive. And that's the main thing that separates the book from the movie. It isn't afraid to challenge kids instead of pandering to them. It makes a statement. A statement that, whether you like it or not, will always stick with you and get you curious enough to come back sooner or later if you're not ready at first. Shit, that's what happened to me. I saw this design a couple months ago after I heard that Home was based on a book, and although I didn't check it out at the time, this design never left my mind. It stayed in the back of my head for weeks on end until I finally decided to pick up the book out of curiosity, and honestly, I'm so glad that I did, since it helped me find the great thing Home decided not to be. With that said, I've been Just Stop, you've been erased.
and thanks for watching.